Amen. Thank you, Dan. Actually, we're going to be talking about that power today. My scripture comes from Mark chapter 16. I'm going to pick up where Bill Vanderbush left off last week. Verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with the hands and drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. And the Lord Jesus, and after he had spoken these things to them, he was taken up to heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. And the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this is Mark's version of Matthew's Great Commission. And maybe in some of your Bibles, you'll notice that this is bracketed off as potentially not the original ending. A lot of scholars think that Mark ended in verse 8, and they went away afraid. And then somebody came along and said, you know, that ending's too abrupt, and they gave it a, a, a better send-off. And I want you to notice something, that following Jesus is supposed to be a miraculous lifestyle. I mean, we cast out demons, speak in tongues, and we can overcome natural circumstances like snake bites. We lay hands on the sick and they recover. It's kind of confusing, though, because there's a lot of uh, opinions about all this activity. It reminds me of the cop that pulled a carload of nuns over. Sister, the speed limit's 65 miles per hour. Why are you going so slow? And the nun responded, well, I saw a sign that read 22. The officer said, that's not the speed limit. That's the road that you're on, the name of the highway you're traveling on. The nun said, silly me. Thanks for letting me know. And the officer looked into the back of the car, and, and he asked, why are all the other nuns trembling and shaking? And she said, well, we just got off Highway 119. <laughs> you see, sometimes we don't always interpret the signs correctly. And, and right off the bat, there's a misinterpretation of our passage. Well, we've got churches where they pick up snakes and have them bite themselves and show how spiritual I am because I can carry out Mark chapter 16, verse 18. I remember watching a documentary on these uh, snake handling churches, and one man explained, anybody can get bit by a snake and survive it, but to drink the strychnine, you better be living right. <laughs> and actually, the snake bite comment was played out in Acts 28.3. The apostle Paul is on his way to Rome to give an account of his ministry to Caesar, and as he's collecting wood, a dangerous viper comes out, bites him on the arm. He shakes it off into the fire and continues to uh, collect wood. Well, all the natives on the island, they see what happened, and they know this is an extremely poisonous snake, so they stand around waiting for Paul to die, and he doesn't die, so they conclude, well, he must be a god. And I want you to notice, when Paul gets bit by this dangerous snake, he doesn't start freaking out, going, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm going to die. No, he shakes it off. Why this response? Because he's read this verse in the Bible. He's embraced this promise from Jesus. He knows that in Jesus Christ, we can overcome the natural forces of this world, especially when your life has a divine purpose. See, Paul's on his way to Rome to give testimony to Caesar. This has been prophesied over him. He isn't in Rome yet. He hasn't fulfilled this prophecy. And so he knows that nothing, not even a dangerous snake, can overcome what God has spoken over him. And I want to ask you right now, could you imagine living this way, having a godly plan so that 
Whenever a trial rises up before you, you don't melt into a dysfunctional puddle because you know God is fighting for you. He's going to complete the good work that he began in you. You know, in our life group, we have a, a, a man who's had trouble at work. His boss has been bullying him and threatening his, to ruin his career. And so the life group's been praying over it for the last few weeks. And we watched his life go from bad to worse. And we kept praying. And suddenly, you know, our, our friend, he's willing just to quit or take a demotion. He just wants out from this negative situation. And then things get even worse. And guess what? That's when God steps in and gives this man a radical promotion above the boss that's been bullying him. And I remember that during the multi-month prayers that we were lifting up, we claimed the Bible promises that, that were there for us to, to grab hold of. We reminded our friend of his identity in Christ. You belong to Jesus, and he's going to work for you. We counseled him not to be hasty and make, a, and make a bad decision, but to give God a chance to move. Because you know this, when you belong to the Lord, he's going to be part of the outcome of whatever's going on in your life. And this is something that all of us need to do. We need to shake it off when we get attacked. In fact, this is one of my favorite parenting phrases. My kids would fall down and scrape their knees, and I would tell them, shake it off, you know. They'd come crying, Daddy, shake it off. Okay. <laughs> so they'd go to Mom now, you know. Uh, but really, friends, the Lord is going to fight for you. Your problems become his problems because that's how much he cares for you. That's how much he's invested himself in you. And when trials like the snakes surround us who bite, friends, these are merely opportunities to get recentered on our antidote. Jesus Christ. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. You got a problem going on in your life right now? That's just an invitation to get recentered on Jesus, who is the antidote to whatever person, problem, situation, whatever that you're facing right now. I guess the real question is do you know your life to have an intentional divine purpose? Do you take God to work? and change the atmosphere with the people around you? Do you cultivate Jesus in another person's life? Are you handing a hurt over to the forgiveness process? Do you seek to experience and share Jesus as you go through your every day? Because I guarantee you, as you live this way, God's going to get activated, and when his agenda is your agenda, your problems are his problems. But there's another dimension I want to address from Paul's encounter with the snake. He uses it to draw attention to Jesus. Remember, all the natives are waiting to see him die, and he doesn't die. And so they go, wow, you must be a god. And he doesn't go, well, you know, I am pretty holy. Okay? He's like, yeah, I'm not dying because I want to tell you about this god that I belong to who has an amazing power to bless us. You know, we don't go around proving our faith by drawing attention to how holy I am or how biblically astute I am, or how my theology is, is so accurate. No, we point people to Jesus through our love. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the true demonstration and proof of our spiritual maturity, the love that's pouring out from us to others, to our enemies, our spouses, those beneath us, those above us, those who make mistakes, those who are different from us. Now, you have to know when you read a list like, you know, casting out demons and healing the sick and speaking in tongues, people get all upset. You know, the miracles of Christ stopped when the last apostle died. You know, and I, I did a whole bunch of research this, this weekend to to go over their arguments, and I'm not going to waste any of our time on that. I just want you to know one of the big arguments is Revelation 22. If anybody adds to the words of this book or takes away from the words, you're going to be cursed. Well, here's the problem. The miracles just kept happening after the apostles died into the beginning of the church, throughout church history, and they're happening today. You know, Jesus says, greater things will you do because I go to the Father. 
And, and when Jesus goes to the Father, that means he's sitting at the right hand of God, praying for you, interceding on your behalf. And friends, he put his Holy Spirit inside of each one of us. This is how he pours into our lives the touch of God for you and through you to others. The purpose of this touch is to draw everybody into encounter with our Lord. And doesn't it make sense? God makes us to be in a relationship with him, and shouldn't his touch be upon us as we go through life? You know, Jesus told one person, be it done for you according to your faith. And for the people who don't believe, they don't see any miracles. Well, you're not going to see any miracles because you're not open to them. Okay? If you expect to receive nothing, guess what you get? What did Gretzky say? You're going to miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Okay? I like what James 4, 2 says. You do not have because you do not ask. And I get this from Christians all the time. Pastor, I'm not going to ask for myself. I'm only going to ask for others. And I'm like, well, don't you know how much God cares about you, how much he loves you, how much he wants to work in your life? Of course he wants to bless you. Now, if you only pray about yourself, it's going to be a problem. But if you pray for yourself, you pray for others, that's the flow of God to you, through you. It's an amazing cycle. And I guess when I read this list, I want you to understand that there is resurrection power available for you. Friends, are you enjoying any of the things that I just read to you from Mark chapter 16? Because if you're not, it might be you haven't stepped all the way into your relationship with Jesus. You know, last week I was listening to Matt Didway, our youth director, uh, teach to the high schoolers, and he mentioned that fellowship is an action word. When you come to church and sit and listen to a sermon, when you stand and sing some songs, that's actually not biblical fellowship. A biblical fellowship is when you and I get actively involved in one another's lives, one another's spiritual journey. That's what biblical fellowship is. And guess what? The word believe, it's an action word as well. It means to entrust yourself to somebody else. It doesn't mean, yeah, I believe in that, that, that concept that you told me. It's when you entrust yourself to this God that you've heard about and start to follow and engage and pray to and, and give access to. That's when faith comes alive. That's when belief is being actualized. Kind of interesting. We're called to believe that way and, and get baptized. And, and you know what baptism literally means? It means to be fully immersed. To immerse yourself in your new belief that God is alive and moving in your life. And friends, I want you to hear me. This is the necessary ingredient that releases the resurrection power. You weren't saved merely to go to heaven. You were saved to go to heaven and experience heaven now, right here, the presence of God for you. So we immerse ourselves in his promises, his word, his character, his nature, his presence, his power. It's when we're fully persuaded that what God has said is true and valid for you today. It's kind of a tough question. Are you fully persuaded that God is for you and moving to you and through you right now? Well, one of the things we're supposed to do is cast out demons. And I'll be honest, I've encountered the demonic on a few occasions. It's not a main regular part of my ministry. Um, thank God. And we usually think of the demonic like, you know, the movie The Exorcist, you know, people's heads spinning around and green pea soup coming out and stuff. And, and, and the, wow, that's pretty nasty. But actually, I think we get to see the work of the demonic around us all the time. You know, right now I'm reading about William Wilberforce, who's probably one of the greatest men of all time. You know, when England, England was so vast that the sun never set on the British Empire, well, God introduced himself to Wilberforce, who was on the parliament in England, and he became the tool that God used to put an end to slavery. Now, think about this. England pretty much has outposts all over the world. Everybody's enslaved across the world. Wilberforce puts a stop to the English slavery, and we all know that. But what I didn't know is that he set out to 
to transform the entire culture of England. And this included addressing child labor laws or lack of laws. They'd have five-year-olds working 12-hour days in horrendous conditions, okay? Ram rampant alcoholism was at such epic proportions, it was said that everybody in England was drunk. Sex trafficking was staggering with 25% of the women in London prostituted out. Public executions over small offenses, legal injustices, abominable prison situations, animal cruelty. Do, do you see how the demonic had destroyed the greatest civilization on earth at that time from within? Well, it gets personal. Jesus says you can cast out evil. And how many times have you watched the news or come across a, a situation and go, oh boy, that's, that's horrible. Our world's really a mess. Too bad somebody can't do something about it. You can. You can start praying. And in fact, you can use a life group to get together and start praying against a specific evil and then start using your networks and then come to the pastor and say, we got to do something about it. And here's the agenda. And then the church starts praying and we connect with other networks. And guess what happens? We change legislation. And, and, and evil gets stopped in yet another way. You know, the Bible tells us the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You have power over the gates of hell. You know, we found poverty on 192, so we built the Hope Center. We plan on moving on to a, a, another project soon. And here's the deal. Does your prayer life or your checkbook well, your conversations have anything to do about the evils going on in this world? Does this break in your heart so that you're upset about it enough to at least pray over it? You know, you don't get to just sit back and go, oh, the world's a mess, I can't wait to go to heaven. No, we're supposed to bring heaven to earth so people encounter our Lord and Savior. Well, that's casting out demons. We're supposed to lay hands on people and heal them. And, and this becomes a problem throughout church denominations. Some people turn it into a test of your faith. You know, if I pray over you and you're not healed, that means that you don't have enough faith. Now, how do you think that's going to make somebody feel? They're going to lose their faith altogether. They're going to have a problem with God. And, and so a lot of people have just dismissed, I'm not going to ask God for prayers. And I think that's a lack of faith. Friends, I want you to understand the emotional investment that God has made towards you. He loves you. And healings happen. I had a weird experience this week. Somebody was talking about, um, you, know, you know, I had this problem and I went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you must be in amazing amounts of pain. And, and, and she said, no, I'm not. A pastor came into the hospital and prayed over me. I don't have any pain. It's the first time I heard that. Okay. I laid hands on her. I didn't, she didn't tell me that she was healed, you know. Just kind of something that she experienced and, and put it to her testimony. And you're like, wow, what a cool thing. You know, I get excited about that. I came in here and got on my knees and said, God, thank you. But I've also came in here and got on my knees and cried because he didn't heal some people. You never know when God's going to move and when he's not going to move. And a lot of people feel that because he doesn't heal like he did in Jesus' day, healing must not apply to our lives now. But I want you to hear me. When you pray, every time you pray, God gets activated. That's the biblical promise over and over. Remember when the missionary was here last week and she said, I was praying for somebody's ear and the ear didn't get healed, but they got healed emotionally. All the hurts and, and, and pains of their lives, gone. It was a much more necessary healing than, than fixing her, her, her left ear. And sometimes we pray on somebody and they get healed later in the week. Or it's a process, you know, that it happens after they reconcile in a relationship or when they let something go. And sometimes you are in the company of the Apostle Paul when he said, Lord, would you heal this? And God said, no, I'm not going to take that away from you. This is going to be an anchor in your life of my grace for you. 
I remember one time asking my pastor, well, how come God won't take this, this desire out of my heart? You know, why won't he free me from this? And, and my pastor said, are you kidding me? With your biblical knowledge, if God was to do that, you'd be a monster. You see, I hadn't experienced grace yet. And so everybody who I would encounter, I would have been laying down the serious biblical standards and mandates. And if you're not doing this, <laughs> you know, well, nobody can do that. That's why Jesus came on the cross. And he gets into our lives and he starts changing us from within. Grace. Sometimes he leaves it in our lives, the problem it is, so that we'll cling to him. And by the way, he might say no to this, but he'll say yes to something else. Don't give up on him because he said no here. He's got a whole bunch of yeses waiting for you in other areas. Well, what about speaking in tongues? You know, some denominations say, unless you speak in tongues, you haven't really accepted Jesus. Okay? Okay. Now, we don't believe this, but this whole baptism to being, uh, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a, it's a difficult concept, the baptism of the Spirit. And, and speaking in tongues, there's two kinds of tongues. There's the, there's the one where I say something from up here, and then you interpret it from out there. Okay, that's the tongue for the body. But then there's your personal tongue, which God gives you, and it's a praise, it's a prayer, it builds up the individual. Remember in Romans 8 where he says something that the spirit prays with groanings too deep for words? One time somebody from the church came in and said, Pastor, you talk about tongues and it's been proven that, that that's a thing of the past. Why do you talk about it? So I said, well, let's come into my office. So we sat down and we spent an hour going through all the places in the Bible. Talked about tongues and she left going, oh my goodness, this is really a gift that's available to us now. I said, Yes. And guess what? I didn't pray over her and she spoke in tongues. That didn't happen. Okay? But guess what did happen? She was now open to letting the Holy Spirit into her life in a fresh new way. And by the way, Moses, Jesus, and Paul all expected this to be a normal event in the life of a believer. It's the spiritual protection over you, the spirit within you praying on your behalf. But by the way, it's the least of the gifts. There's so many more other gifts that God wants you to have. It's not whether you speak in tongues. It's about whether the Holy Spirit is at the helm of your life. Well, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. My preaching was not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Friends, do you have any of God's power moving in and through your life right now? I mean, how often do we settle on spiritual goosebumps when we get a warm fuzzy about, you know, uh, something in, in worship? Or, or we get a fresh insight and, you know, it, it's, it's a spiritual rush for us. No, the spiritual power, the resurrection power that God has for you is, is his presence, his purposes, his miraculous supernatural touch being released to you and through you when you're going through a difficult time he's there somebody else is going through a difficult time you can step forward on his behalf and release his touch when you seek to experience and share jesus every moment of your life guess what he shows up well coming to the end of a job interview, and the HR officer asked the young engineer fresh out of college, uh, what starting salary are you looking for? And the young man replies, in the region of 200000 a year, depending on the benefits package. So the interviewer inquires, he says, well, what would you say to a package of five weeks vacation, 14 days paid sick leave, full medical and dental, a company matching retirement fund at 50% of your salary, a company car leased every two years, how about a red Corvette? And the hopeful engineer sits up and says, wow, are you kidding? And the interview said, yeah, but you started it. <laughs> you know, sometimes things seem too good to be true. And it, I wonder if that could be said of our Christianity. Now, let me get this straight. God has a place for me in heaven forever. 
And not only a place for me in heaven, but he's with me now. And that every sin I commit gets forgiven. And at all times, I have the movement of God available to call upon in whatever situation I find myself in. Yep, that's what I'm telling you. You know, this one man approached the Christian and said, so you're a Christian? The Christian said, yeah. So you're one of those people that believes that God raised the dead and that Jesus did all those miracles and that God made humanity. We weren't the result of evolution. The Christian says, yeah. And expecting to be ridiculed, the man says, well, I wish I could believe that. I'm going to ask you, do you believe that? I mean, we know it conceptually, but do you believe it enough to pray it into existence? Do you believe it enough to know that the heart of God is for you and he wants to move in and through you? Do you understand the miraculous resurrection life that, that God has promised for us, the adventure of faith that you and I can go on? Leads us to the communion table. See, we had a problem. God made us to be in a relationship with him, and sin messed it all up, broke that relationship. So God sent his son to fix that relationship so that you now have access to the throne of mercy at all times. Let me tell you how communion works here in our church. You don't have to be a, a, a member of our church. You don't have to be a Presbyterian. We merely ask that you embrace what Jesus has done for you on the cross. And the invitation is from God to you. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, we usually start from the back rows and we come forward. We take the bread, we dip it into the cup, and we receive it that way. If you're worried about the bread, we have gluten-free wafers. If you're worried about the cup, it's unfermented wine. No problems there. Uh, we do ask if you drop your bread in the cup that you don't dig around for it, okay? Just reach back and get a fresh piece. But most importantly today, as you come forward, I'd love for you to ponder, is that resurrection life something that I'm experiencing? Because if not, there's a whole special gift awaiting you. Life with God moving in and through you. Well, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread, and first he blessed it, and then he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, this cup is the covenant of my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. Drink ye of it, and be thankful. Will the elders please come forward? Will the people of God please come forward?
Gracious God, thank you for this meal where you nurture our souls. May we go out and experience the resurrection power and lifestyle. Bless, cover, care for, and use us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.